It's time for the annual U.S. State of the Union address again on Tuesday evening. U.S. President Joe Biden started his State of the Union address, otherwise known as SOTU, to a divided Congress halfway through his term. The address traditionally focuses on domestic issues, but given the ongoing finger pointing between the U.S. and China after the U.S. shot down, what China says is a weather monitoring airship. Has this year's SOTU address been different? What is President Biden's saying about China. Given his upside down approval rating, will his words vaporize just like hot air? I'm pleased to be joined from Maryland, U.S. by uh, Saurabh Gupta, Senior Asia-Pacific International Relations Policy Specialist at the Institute for China-America Studies. From Portland, U.S. by Professor Liang Yan, Kremer Chair Professor of Economics at uh, William Met University. And from Beijing by Zhao Hai, Director of International Political Studies at the National Institute for Global Strategy. Welcome to all of you. So let's start right away by what President Biden just said about China moments ago literally he said uh, we've made clear and I've made clear my, I've made my personal conversation with many with President Xi that we see competition with China not conflict he said but I will make no apologies that we're investing to make America uh, strong investing in American innovation in industries that would define the future and that China's government intends to be dominating, he says. Concerning what happened over what China says to be the airship inst incident, um, Biden said, today we're in the strongest position in decades to compete with China or anyone else in the world and anyone else. And anyone else in the world. He said, I'm committed to work with China where I where it can to advance American interests and benefit the world. But make no mistake about it, as we made clear last week, if China threatens our sovereignty, we will act to protect our country. And we did. Look, let's be clear. Winning the competition should unite all of us. We face serious challenges across the world. Um, Mr. Gupta, let me go to you first. What do you read from this paragraph? Of course, there are other things he said as well, but uh, uh, these are the gist of what he talked about on China. What do you read from it? What I read from it is that Mr. Biden is staying consistent to the line that he has had from day one in his administration with regard to China, and that this is an administ administration which is focused on extreme competition with China. But extreme competition, in his view, doesn't necessarily has to devolve into conflict. And therefore, he has talked about trying to create guardrails. Whether those guardrails could be created is still up in the air, simply because there has been an exchange of good intentions by both sides. But as we've seen with this past weekend itself, intentions, it's hard to translate intentions into actions. Until that happens, we are going, we will just have a relationship which is unstable and which will, which, which adds a, an element of instability to regional affairs and international affairs. So I don't see something different in terms of what Mr. Biden spoke at SOTU. And in fact, I think he is very clear that China is a peer competitor to him. In fact, he had, he mentioned clearly in terms of trying to outcompete Mr. President Xi Jinping, he spoke very directly who is the other leader in the world who's gone up with Mr. Xi Jinping this year? And he's, he's trying to show that he has the upper hand on President Xi this year. No other leader could do that. And in a way, you know, it's, it's actually a compliment to China that China is this peer competitor of the United States, which has been this superpower of the 20th, 20th century. And yeah. China has caught up, and that's what I read in it. Okay, Professor Liang, do you see it that's what, that way? That you know, being seen as the most, oh, one of the the, the most formidable uh, rivals of the United States is a compliment for China. But uh, in real policies, what would that mean? Yeah, I think to some extent, maybe um, that's a good sign to say that you know China is becoming so strong and becoming um, such a competitor. But that said, I think a lot of the policies so far have been really counterproductive. I think there's a lot of areas where China and the United States would have to collaborate. And I think setting the guardrail um, to avoid conflict 
it's a necessity, but it's really a low bar. Um, I think, you know, with climate change, with, you know, many of the geopolitical tensions that are around the world, and also with the, you know, urgency of recovering the economy from post-pandemic, uh, you know, stagnation, um, there are many areas I think the two countries should really collaborate as, as opposed to be just, you know, uh, uh, competing to trying to drag each other down instead of trying to, you know, um, uh, climb up and trying to, you know, emulate each other. Mm. Mr. Chow, is there anything different, anything special in what he see in what President Biden said to you? Uh, do you see him trying to balance toughness with restraint uh, as what he should do in such kind of a address? Yeah, I think uh, on the one hand, I agree with the previous speakers that uh, uh, Biden uh, speech uh, has nothing new vis-a-vis uh, -vis the previous policy declarations, particularly from last May, uh, when uh, Secretary Blinken uh, talked about uh, its policy towards China based on uh, investment alignment and competition. However, in this speech, of course, you can see that President Biden is speaking to domestic audience and he's trying to reinforce his position as continue to be tough on China and fend off any challenge from the opposition, from particularly uh, uh, Republicans that challenge him and, and uh, talk about him being soft or being uh, surrendering American sovereignty uh, to China. So in his speech, he emphasized he's been, he has the strongest position uh, in the past decades over China. And secondly, of course, the recent balloon incident has been, you know, uh, very quickly put into his speech. He talked about protecting American sovereignty. That's good because China also needs to protect its sovereignty and therefore the U.S. Sh should respect China's sovereignty, uh, to, particularly on the issue of Taiwan. So if uh, the U.S. asking China to respect its sovereignty, this should be mutual and China asking for mutual respect between the two countries and peaceful coexistence. So, yes, I think moving forward, if uh, President Biden really wanted to cooperate where two countries uh, need to be, then uh, on other issues, uh, we need to draw the red line and have a, a put a floor or a guardrail between these two countries. Right. Well, uh, especially if he talks about all the challenges humanities are facing across the world. Um, I, I want to focus on some of the domestic issues that he touched upon. Where I find it puzzling is it seems that some of the goals President Biden outlined uh, contradict or may not be achieved by some of the practices that he's uh, uh, preaching. For instance, he wants to boost the American middle class, but by, by, by competing with China, or by, by keeping China down, for instance, is that going to serve the purpose of enriching the American middle class? Let's take trade as an example. For instance, bilateral trade actually went, achieved an all-time high in the year 2020, and trade with China is an important part of the American middle class prosperity, if you can put it that way. So, Mr. Gupta, do you see the kind of contradiction in what he plan says he plans to achieve and what he is planning to do vis-a-vis -vis China. I absolutely see the contradiction and it's a really good point that you have pointed out because the contradiction out here is that Mr. Biden is actually looking at short-term gains through protectionist measures and creating jobs through a lot of fiscal spending. And it will create jobs and it will create growth but what it will not create is having America operate at its productivity frontier. For America to operate at its, at its most productive, it needs to have an open economy and trade with its most consequential trading partners. And so what is going to happen is behind these barriers and these walls, jobs will be created, but there will not be top-notch competitive positions and so while the jobs will be created at home, they will not be able to export out from the U.S. because you, the United States would not be the top-notch competitive producer of products. And I think to overcome that barrier, the way to go about doing it is having an open trading system, particularly, as I said, with China and with Asia, and not use the various maneuvers that he has talked about. In fact, the very first legislative accomplishment that he pointed to was the CHIPS Act. And right. yes, it will create jobs. And he talked of the Inflation Reduction Act, et cetera, and the Infrastructure Act. But what's going to happen with this Buy America provisions and those other provisions is America is not going to be a cutting edge producer. 
He is manufacturing jobs in the short term, which will haunt America in the longer right. term. And the way to do that is to have an open trading arrangement with your trading partners. Professor Liang, do you see a problem there? Because he was talking about manufacturing jobs coming back to the United States and he expects more manufacturing jobs to come back to the United States and that the supply chain begins in America. But with the high wages, for instance, with the lack of training, with the kind of costs uh, of production, is it likely to happen that uh, the middle class will be wealthier, the poorer will get richer? and 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 meanwhile you know to have the kind of manufacturing back in the united states and to keep in innovation in the united states alone yeah i think that's a great question i think you know reshoring manufacturing jobs is a great political rhetoric but it does not make a lot of economic sense what he really needs to be talking about is how we create high value um, high skill high paid jobs uh, within the United States, instead of having this zero my, uh, zero sum game mindset. And I agree with you what you just mentioned about costs. Um, we know in terms of the chips, for example, um, let me back up back, back up a little bit more. I think, again, if, if you want to create jobs, that's totally fine. And I think that should be the priority of the American president. But I don't think you need to ban you know, the exports of chips or other high tech um, to China or um, in some ways entice your businesses to come back to uh, the United States without any considerations of you know, cost and efficiency. Um, so when it comes to the cost, um, I think the United States has been really good at you know, designing the chips. And we know the chip designers' gross margin is way higher than you know, chip manufacturing, assembly, and testing. And that's one point. I think countries can specialize, right? And the other point is, um, you know, chip production does have very high costs, 10 to $20 billion at the initial stage, and it takes more, over five years to, to build. Um, also, it's very high, you know, resource cost when it comes to water, for example. It takes 4.7 million gallons of water every day, and so on and so forth. So I think regardless of the considerations of costs, and just wanted to bring jobs back home, I think that will hurt the U.S.'s bottom line in the long term. Um, not to mention, you know, the allocation of resources and human capital in, uh, you know, the bring jobs versus, you know, the, 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 the uh, manufacturing jobs. Um, so I think there are a lot of problems with this kind of political rhetoric without really cool economic calculations mm. and thinking. Mm. Well, um, Mr. Chow, as I mentioned earlier, the public opinion is upside down, at least according to a, a poll by conducted by ABC and Wall Street uh, Journal. Um, a great majority of Americans think that their lives have uh, uh, not gotten better. Uh, they have a very strong lack of uh, confidence in the Biden administration, in the Democratic Party and in the Republicans for working together and for their leadership. Uh, but if you, if you look at the optics, if you listen to the speech, it sounds like they're all agreeing with each other, except in a, in a few points when it comes to debt, for instance. Uh, so exactly what's the reality? Um, why do American electorate not buying what uh, Biden seems to be trying to sell? Well, because uh, U.S. statistics is disconnected with common people's lives. That's one of the fundamental problems. Uh, when uh, President Biden is showing off his numbers, for instance, created 12 million jobs in two years, or uh, the economy is growing uh, in a pretty fast uh, rate, and also inflation is going down, yeah, some of those are true. However, the common people are not feeling it. And that's why when people are talking about real income, real life experience, these are disconnected with those numbers because those numbers in, in many ways are doctored oh. or not really reflecting the daily life. Okay. Uh, one thing is important because the, this administration continue to say they're going to use uh, follow middle class economics, mm -hmm. right? And then they use national security excuses to crack down on trade. So overall, in the long period, that's actually a reflection of protectionism and populism. All we right. all know the end, end game of we those uh, trends. We might have to leave it there. Thank you so much, gentlemen. And uh, of course, uh, Liang Yan uh, as well joining us. Uh, my guests have been Surata, Surab Gupta, Liang Yan, and Zhao Hai. We are going to leave it there. Um, President Biden says, let's get the job done. Good luck. Um, we'll take a short break. And when we come back, U.S. Secretary of State uh, Anthony Blinken canceled his uh, China visit over the weekend over a U.S. shooting down of a Chinese civilian unmanned airship. Where does that leave China-U.S. relations? Stay tuned.